father died this past week. But as Charles noted in the speech, today we are not just neighbors, but old friends who tragically have traveled a troubled road along which many wrongs have been done. I wonder here whether I might quote from the words of a cork man, the poet and theologian, Padrago Tuama, whom I met with my wife and I visited when we visited the Corimila community in Northern Ireland three years ago. His poem, Shaking Hands, makes reaching out an imperative of leadership. Thank you for joining us today. We're, we're thrilled to have you. Thanks, Mark. It's um, so nice to be with you all. Thanks for the invitation. Um, do you have other things to say or will I launch in? No, I've just been right at it. I've just been spotlighted. So, well, it's very nice to be with you. I have such fond memories of having been um, at your congregation um, a few years ago now. So um, I look forward to another time of visiting in person. But for now, you're all in the northwest of Ireland and it's nice to have you here. Thanks very much for um, for coming and uh, for your kind interest. We're going to be thinking about forgiveness today and thinking about forgiveness through the lens of some poems, some of mine and some of other people's. Um, I'm mostly looking forward to some Q&A. That's always my favorite part. So um, if you have questions, you can put them, you can just note them down yourself or you can put them in the chat. I won't be reading them while I'm talking though. It's a bit too distracting, but I will get to them in a while and I'd be thrilled to talk with you about forgiveness. Um, Forgiveness or forgiving, as I suppose I'd like to talk about it really, is a, um, is a complicated thing to talk about. Um, often forgiveness is put across like a noun, like something you've done um, and that it's completed. It's a thing. You know, I, I have I had forgiveness after that particular difficult period of time or it's it's often spoken of in the past tense. I forgave them. And I suppose I'm interested in thinking about forgiveness and forgiving as an ongoing event, something that you live with and something that we have, depending as to the time of day, not just depending as to what year it is, um, a closer or a more difficult relationship with. And that the whole point of forgiving is for it to be an active verb. I used to run a, a project that looked at forgiveness and I, I read so many definitions of forgiveness there were so many one of the ones that struck me most powerfully was one about um choosing not to hold something against someone and um and ultimately to think about wishing them well and i found that to be a nice simple one that i could think about um easily but also had um all kinds of hidden depths because if somebody has done me a terrible injustice for me to wish them well is also to wish justice um, it isn't just to excuse or to create a situation where they might be doing the same thing to other people. To wish them well is also to wish them integrity, to wish them accountability. And um, I, I think sometimes there has been some terrible damage, as we'll talk about today, done in the name of really uh, flimsy and unsatisfactory and endangering definitions of forgiveness. I've heard of forgiveness too as um, the giving of an undeserved gift and I think that can be a very helpful um, that can be a very helpful definition provided it's chosen freely. Um, there are so many situations especially in a faith context I think where people feel like they have to do the thing that's undeserved because they have to do it because if they don't do it somehow they'll be failing a moral test themselves and there might be some kind of level of personal failure then that you'll be failing because you didn't forgive and I, I think that can be a, a burden upon the burdened um, forgiveness will always bring up civic and interpersonal and reciprocal questions does it require apology does it require change does it require that some kind of sense of trust or um, engagement or friendship or intimacy is reestablished? Can you forgive from a distance? Um, can you forgive on behalf of somebody? Um, so often in the north of Ireland, there would have been a situation where there would have been a family who'd gone through murder, or who'd, you know, where they'd been bereaved by murder, whether by the police or by a paramilitary organization. And um, some of the surviving members of that family might have extended forgiveness to the people who had pulled the trigger. 
And I think that's a very powerful thing that they chose to do. And it's always t- get, gotten a lot of headlines here. And I know there's instances all over the world where we hear those stories. One of the questions is, is who's allowed to forgive the killers? <laughs> is it the survivors? Would it only have been the person who was killed? How do we know they'd want them to be forgiven? How do we understand this complicated word? Then not only thinking about whether there's a reciprocality of some kind of apology and some kind of change or possibility of repentance, there's the question then about can we forgive the dead? And what's that like? This requires us to think about what do we hold against the dead? What are the things that we continue to think about, that we continue to keep alive, even though that person is not alive, that they have died? How is it that somehow something stays in us? There can be all kinds of ways within which on a weekly or monthly or even daily basis, you can keep something alive that has bothered you. The person who you're holding it against may not even know that you spend so much of your time investing in them. (laughs) They may not know that so much of your creative and imaginative time is giving to imagine what you would say to them if you had the capacity or if they would shut up long enough to listen or if they were alive again or if, or if, or if. That's a lot of um, creative time that we give to keeping something alive when somebody might either be dead or might as well be dead from the point of view of any sense of connection or also um, might have totally forgotten about if they even recognized what they knew, they, what, what they had done. None of this is to minimize the hurts that we carry, but it is to, to problematize the ground on which we stand when we carry a hurt. I know I'm speaking to people who know all this because we're human. I don't think you can get to being any kind of an age as an adult, never mind as a teenager, um, without having had the experience of needing to come up with a question of, do I wish to forgive or do I wish to apologize? How do I wish to understand this? Can I imagine trust as possible? Can I imagine there's anything like um, coming back towards each other as if nothing ever happened or as if trying to create some new ground with each other. All of those things um, are present in the air. I like to think about um, forgiving. I mentioned this already, not forgiveness. And to think about having a relationship with forgiving. Um, Like lots of us, I went through some particularly difficult experiences in my younger life, some pretty... um, atrocious ones and I used to feel very guilty that I hadn't forgiven one particular perpetrator and they had had a terrible effect in my life it is safe to say a lifelong effect in my life so this wasn't something light and easy and the guilt about finding it difficult to forgive was just as hard as the experience in itself Um, and so therefore I think what has helped has been to to think about where am I with forgiving today Am I in a day where I'm actually back in the pain? Am I in a day where somehow safety feels um, disestablished? Or am I, a, am I in a day where creativity seems possible? And knowing how to measure the weather, if you like, of forgiving has helped to just be able to take a gauge for that. For those of us who live with something that is very, very particular and has had a life changing effect in our lives. Um, Richard Holloway is the retired Episcopal Bishop of Edinburgh, and I admire his writing very much. And he thinks of forgiveness and forgiving as a creative act, that in the face of somebody's actions towards us that have been destructive, that forgiving is a choice towards creativity, a choice to say, I am going to interrupt the predictable cycle of revenge or even resentment or obsession, and I'm going to choose to do something creative. In that way, he's kind of implying that forgiving can be done whether or not the person knows what they've done or has any desire to repent or change or acknowledge that somehow what it, is, what it requires in me is to go, I know they hurt me. And actually, I am seeking in the narrative of my life to be some kind of creative response to something that was destructive and that that itself is an interrupting of a of a cycle of escalating revenge or escalating resentment that can be very powerful and very controlling in our lives i know you know this we all live with this kinds of experience and the irish word for forgiveness is mahunus and this word um, builds on the root word of good 
And so if I was to say to you, forgive me, I would say madam. And madam literally means good me. In a certain sense, if I'm asking for forgiveness, I'm saying to you that I have rescinded some of the possibility of my own goodness. And I'm asking you to re-good me because I have done damage to it by the way that I've hurt you. I like that because I, I think that opens up something really powerful. I, I like to think of forgiving as being one of the many good options about what to do when life has become difficult. <laughs> and that's really important to say because so many of us have been manipulated in forgiveness um, and told, well, you can either be forgiving or you can die a bitter bastard. And the, the, those are two options. And those are two terrible options because that's a dangerous way to think. It's a binary way to think. It's also an uncreative and predictably boring way to think. There are all kinds of creative ways to live in the wake of something terrible. And I, I, I highlight a few of these through stories and then we look at some poems. And don't forget to store up your questions so that we can have a conversation. Um, a few years back, many, I don't know, 15 years ago now, a teacher phoned me up in December, a teacher of a high school and he, a secondary school, we'd call it here. And he um, said to me, you have to come into our class on Monday. I don't care what you're doing, cancel it, um, rearrange everything. You have to come in. It was Friday. He'd phoned me. And in, in fact, I was teaching a university class and he said, I don't care. Um, one of the girls in his class, he had a, a cla he taught in an all girls Catholic school. One of the girls had been killed um, when a bus had been turning a corner in Belfast. And the bus wasn't going that fast, maybe 15 miles an hour, but because the bus was turning a very particularly sharp corner, the front of the bus was going much, much faster than 15 miles an hour. Anyway, the bus had swept over the, um, the footpath and had uh, killed a, a young girl who was 15 called Kira Parks. Um, the engineering in that part of Belfast city had been really poorly done. The roadworks had been the cause of regular, regular um, complaints to the to the city council. And the the rest of the classmates of this girl who had died had decided that they wanted to write a letter to the um, bus driver. And the teacher was a teacher of politics and history, was a warm hearted man. And he said he didn't know what to do. He, he admired the desire of the classmates to do this, but um, he said, I need help. And he said, whatever you're doing, nothing is more important than this. So he was right. <laughs> I like having friends who tell me what to do. So I went into the class and I asked them, do you know, what do you want to say? Um, first of all, we laughed at their teacher a little bit. I called him Darren so that, you know, they could feel a little bit like there was a sense of solidarity. And I said, like, what do you want to say? And I just took notes while they talked. And they said things like, we want to tell him what Kira was like, um, the bus driver. And we want to tell him that it's not his fault. And we want to tell him that even though he doesn't need forgiveness, we'll give it to him anyway, because it wasn't his fault. It was a bad layout of the city. And the city council is going to have to change something because it was almost inevitable that that was going to happen, the way that people would wait on that footpath. And... Um, they sent it to him and uh, I gave them the notes I took and one of them wrote it out and they all signed it. They told him what life she had had. One of the girls in the class had said that she'd been a bit of a bully, had been confronted by Kira, the girl who died, and that the girl who died, Kira, had said to the bully, why can't you just be happy in yourself? And that this had changed this um, classmate's life. And now the girl who'd said this, Kira, was dead. And they were wishing to tell the bus driver about the life, not to make him feel guilty, because he felt guilty enough, but to tell them that her legacy lived on with them and that she had changed them. Anyway, a few weeks later, the bus driver um, wrote back and the teacher called me in and he showed me the letter, to the, the letter that the bus driver had written back to the classmates. And he said to them, I mean, this man was in his um, 50s, I think. And he said to them things like, I will think about your letter every day for the rest of my life. And that was not an exaggeration. You know the way sometimes we think, I think about this day for the rest of my life because it's something good. <laughs> and we forget something else comes in the way. 
but you know if any of you have been in a situation like that um, that you can be burdened upon burdened upon burdened and into this space even though forgiveness wasn't the right word these 15 year olds decided to give that word that was something profoundly creative that they did Thank you, Danielle Pearl, as well. Lots of you will know of who Danielle Pearl is. Her husband um, was a journalist, and right after 9-11, he was um, captured and beheaded in a way that was um, broadcast on the internet. And Danielle Pearl went to meet some of the people who had done this atrocious act and very clearly said that she was not doing this as an act of forgiveness, because forgiveness, if it rested anywhere, rested with her dead husband but she was doing this out of an act of understanding not to say in any way that there was justification but it was for her in a way to find the possibility of connecting you know, at the last moments of her husband's life through the people who had done it this for her was an act of um, confrontation but confrontation done in a way that wasn't escalating conflict but was actually much more difficult than that. Um, she has a deep Buddhist practice and I loved that she was really clear to say this is not an act of forgiveness. This, however, is an act of um, understanding and positive response. Uh, Joe Berry is a woman whose father was murdered by the IRA. He was a conservative politician in Margaret Thatcher's government and the IRA planted a bomb during the Conservative Party's conference in the 80s. And um, Jo grew up in the absence of her father. And as an adult, she began thinking about Ireland and particularly the north of Ireland. She began making trips and trying to come to terms with what had happened. And eventually somebody said to her, um, do you want to meet the man who laid the bomb, who set the bomb? And so she did. And ever since they've met, they have um, been speaking together, Joe Barry and Pat McGee. And at the start, she used the word forgiveness um, to describe their connection with each other. She doesn't use that word anymore. They have a strange kind of friendship. They have a strange kind of intimacy, you could say, in terms of two people who are tied together by all kinds of ways. Um, Joe Barry says that were she born with the politics and the circumstances that Pat Pat McGee, the, the man who planted the bomb, the IRA guy. Joe Berry says that were she born in a similar situation, she too might have justified what he had been doing. Um, and so she holds the justice of saying it was wrong together with um, a new way of being creative and profoundly confronting um, to people who were on the other side of that question. Because in this situation of inherited terror, um, individuals are acting in ways where they're acting out archetypes of history and within the context of this there are all kinds of invitations there are all kinds of ways within which to forgive could be seen to be disloyal but also to continue on the perpetration of escalation of violence and revenge and resentment that that also can continue on the perpetration of a past that is not open to its own changing and then finally is a story i think of doreen lawrence she is a British activist um, and campaigner for police reforming. Her son was murdered in 1993, Stephen Lawrence. He was a teenager. And her campaigning has led, led to an investigation of the police because she did not feel like the London Metropolitan Police did a good enough job of taking seriously the murder of her son, that they just saw it as another black boy being killed. And um, there was at the Home Secretary can't remember um, what you call that in the United States, but the Home Secretary in the British government ordered an investigation into the London Metropolitan Police. And the, the result of that was that that formal official investigation concluded that the Metropolitan Police were institutionally racist. And then an entire um, series of recommendations was put into place, which she has continued to be at the forefront of asking questions about as to whether they're being implemented properly. That's a positive response too. And so what I want to say is that all of these are positive responses in response to something terrible. And the idea of saying forgive or die of bitterness is a terrible and insulting and unintelligent binary to give to people. 
what I think is really possible is to say, what does it mean? What will the shape of you living safely and somehow creatively with this be? The creativity in response to this kind of awfulness might be that you go, I will campaign for justice till my dying day, or I will take up practice, or I will make a pilgrimage of understanding, or I will seek safety for myself, or I wish them well, but I'll also give myself the safety of never having to be alone in the same room as that person. All of these things are creative responses to something terrible. Some of them might use the word forgiveness, some of them not. Some of them might actively reject the word forgiveness because of all kinds of associations with it. The question is, is what does it mean to live safely and creatively and well and with freedom and liberation and choice in response to this? And how do we do this in a way that amplifies the question of the human spirit? And so this, I think, is one of the invitations as we think about what does it mean to live well with our pain? That can be something that's happened between two siblings, um, between people in the same family, between spouses, between lifelong friends. That can be something that happens because people represent different political groups. It might be something that happens because people find themselves on different side of what might be deemed a moral argument. It might be because people are on different sides of privilege one person inheriting tremendous racial or gendered or financial privilege and other people having inherited tremendous um, racial or, gen or gendered or financial, financial um, lack of privilege systemically. And in all these situations, there has to be the question, what does it mean to live creatively and safely and well here? And the idea that there is one shape about how creativity and safety and wellness needs to take shape that is a limiting imagination. I'm going to read some poems for you um, and then we'll take some questions. Um, here's a poem called After the War. I wrote a book called Sorry for Your Troubles a number of years back, which was a book of um, kind of responses to having been a conflict mediator, working with people who've been particularly affected by the troubles in the north of Ireland. And one of the things that you know in conflict resolution is that it's actually right after the moment where a conflict has become resolved. There are all kinds of creative possibilities in that moment when people have realized, my God, I'm still burdened by the terror that we, ha we have done to each other. And there can be all kinds of ways within which resolve can be captured in creativity in that moment after the war. After the war, there was silence, and we heard things our violence could not end. The quiet wind, the lapping water. After the war, we cried then most sadly, oh me, oh my. We have lost what we thought we so badly needed, all that we fought for, and now are left aware and bare and shameful. After the war, there was then no more of us, of me, left for fighting, as we lay sadly down and looked. After the war, we sang badly, with broken hands upon our breasts. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, may we not forget. In situations like, um, as we think of in the north of Ireland, this resolution to not forget is something that goes in more ways than one and in more directions than one. In situations where there's been war, there's often lest we forget. Of course, it's lest we forget the fallen. Absolutely. But it's also lest we forget what we're capable of doing. And also lest we forget that actually there was a peace agreement on the table six months into this war, but we dragged that damn thing on for 30 years. Lest we forget that too lest we forget the pride that politicians can sometimes have before they come to the table of negotiation because they're worried will they get re-elected, lest we forget that, lest we forget all that we realise we're capable of in enactments of addictive cycles of revenge, lest we forget that. And we are so aware of those things of terror in us and in the other, in moments um, right after a resolution that those are things too that we need to pay attention to um, 
lest we forget. Here's another poem called um, Postcards to the Center. Um, and this poem really is about writing uh, postcards being written from two, two centers of conflict, one from the edge to the center. This really is imagining um, the kinds of conflicts that we know so often where there is extraordinary disparities of power. I have sometimes been in situations, I'm a gay man and I've regularly done a lot of conflict resolution in groups where there are LGBT activists trying to engage with those people in, in public who would be calling for us to be um, exercised or kept away or not allowed to have contact through churches or youth groups or all kinds of discriminatory practices. And I have been for many years involved in mediating in those kinds of situations. And regularly what I'll hear is that those people who are conservative about lesbian, gay, bisexual and trans people, regularly what I'll hear is people saying things like, well, look, we've all been hurt on both sides in this conflict. And actually, I'll stop it when somebody says like says that, because we haven't all been hurt, because the lesbian, gay, bisexual and trans people in the room have probably been beaten up, certainly fired, certainly had their jobs under threat, certainly had their homes under threat, certainly had all kinds of terrible situations in their life, systemic injustices against them, that those people who want to say this is a theological issue that we just disagree with, they have not faced those. And so there is a disparity of power. And if we are not capable of recognizing about this thing we disagree over, you have suffered more than I have, well, then we are demonstrating a profound immaturity of imagination of adulthood. It is not a difficult thing to say, okay, I have suffered in my life, but you have suffered far more. And the question is, am I contributing to that systemic suffering? That is not beyond the adult imagination. So this poem is about that. Postcards to the center. To the center from the edge. This circle is marked out by the dredges of your justice. And at these edge place ruts, we eat the crusts of hope. Must this circle never end? Please, can we make a new shape? Shaped a bit like you and shaped like me. Shaped like how we think that things might be if things were not the way they've been. And yes, I know that's a dreamer's dream. But sometimes dreams, like nightmares, can be real. To the center from the edge, we're still here. If you drown out all our voices, you will not drown out your fear. We're still here. To the center from the edge, we will live with you if you will live with us. You go first and then we'll follow. You start off today and we'll catch up tomorrow. To the center from the edge, can we lay down arms, refuse to fire them? even though we've sold our right arms to acquire them. If we stop before we're finished, will we emerge unfinished or defeated? Can we carve out some radius of peace and will we need to fight to keep it? To the center from the edge, we describe the center by our edge place habitation. We inscribe the middle with invisible lamentation. Now we're issuing an invitation. Drink our tears and we'll drink yours. Show your fears and we'll show ours. I'd, for me, this series of uh, postcards written from um, a systemically unprivileged population to a systemically privileged population demonstrates the intimacy of the kind of conversation that's needed, demonstrates the courage that's needed, and demonstrates often that it's those with the most power who manifest the most fear, not because it's justified, but because they have the luxury of thinking that they can live a life without fear. People who have lived through systemic injustice, I think, and in many situations I have when it comes to being a gay man in Ireland, 
I know that actually I am far more used to facing my fear than those people who refuse to face their, their fear by having an honest conversation with me about how their theology has contributed to the death of many LGBT people. Of course, I know that in many other aspects of my life, I live with profound amounts of um, privilege. I'm a white, cisgendered man. My God, I have so much fear to face up to. We're going to look at a poem of Mary Oliver's. Um, Mary Oliver is often known as a poet who spends time um, uh, writing about nature and Mary Oliver is often quoted in a pastoral way. I think what many people don't know is that in most of the books of Mary Oliver she is writing at least one poem that deals with a profound amount of rage. Um, this is a poem that I think I think is written to her father and that is a, a poem confronting the question of his violence towards her. So let me share this poem with you. It's short, but brutal, just to let you know. <laughs> I'll put it on the screen so you can see it. A bitterness. I believe you did not have a happy life. I believe you were cheated. I believe your best friends were loneliness and misery. I believe your busiest enemies were anger and depression. I believe joy was a game you could never play without stumbling. I believe comfort, though you craved it, was forever a stranger. I believe music had to be melancholy or not at all. I believe no trinket, no precious metal shone so bright as your bitterness. I believe you lay down at last in your coffin none the wiser and unassuaged, O oh, cold and dreamless under the wild, amoral, reckless, peaceful flowers of the hillsides. This is a powerful and brutal poem from Mary Oliver, one I think that people may not recognise as being in her voice, but it is most certainly in her voice if you read through her work. There are nine I believes here. You can see them. I believe, I believe, I believe all the way down there. And it almost reads like a creed, but not ideological. It's a narrative creed of what it was like to be in the shadow of whoever this you was, about their life and past and loneliness and burdens, about how joy was stolen from them, but also how they stole joy from other people. They had no comfort and how music could only be one thing for them and about how, the, how much they took a certain kind of comfort in the bitterness that they lived with and that they perpetrated on others. And it is a review of their life. And there is something powerful, I think, in this when it comes to the question of what does it mean to live wisely and well and creatively in the wake of somebody else's pain towards you? Because this is an invitation to tell the truth, an invitation to say, this is what it's been like. In another poem of Mary Oliver's, she is referring to her parents and she says, um, I give them one, two, three, four, the kiss of kindness, of good luck, of thanks, of sleep well on the deep earth. And then she says, but I will not give them the kiss of complicity. I will not give them responsibility for my life. And what we see here is that in order to live a certain kind of pragmatic distancing from a troubled relationship that still needs the truth to be told and I think there's great wisdom in what Mary Oliver is doing here. I don't think this is a revenge poem I think this is a poem with a very definite courageous kind of truth telling of compassion and pity as well as honesty and in this I find something really powerful I believe, I could be wrong, but I believe this was not written to be shared with him, but really was written for her to share with herself. And so I think one of the things we learn when we take some time to think about what is it that forgiving evokes in us, is that forgiving evokes in us these questions about what does it mean to live my own life? What does it mean to think through the levels of safety that I have, the levels of freedom I have, the levels of choice I want, the confronting question as to how do I want to live with this thing that I had no choice in choosing to live with, but how do I want to think about living with it now? 
Do I want to move away from it? Do I find comfort in repeating my resentment every day? How do I measure the disparities of power across which I might lie, either because I've inherited great privilege that I don't want to acknowledge, or because I've inherited great underprivilege that I have to try to force people to acknowledge, even though they don't wish to, because it's embarrassing for them. How do we do this? And how do we speak to each other? Forgiving is not a simple thing that we say in the middle of a prayer and then it's done and we move on to Eucharist. Forgiving, if it's anything, is the art of a life. And the art of a life lived well to pay attention to the difficult things that have been before us. I live in a place where there's a long shadow of um, colonial war. <laughs> uh, I'm speaking to you in the English language. I'm not speaking to you in Irish. Irish is a beautiful language, but I'm not speaking to you in it. And so there's all kinds of things that we need to recognize in the wake of pain that are irretrievable. Hannah Arendt said that, is that forgiveness is the recognition that what has been done cannot be undone. And she suggests that promise might be something that's needed for the future. But it does need the brutality of saying what's been done can't be plastered over when we're speaking about something so significant as the ways within which countries and populations terrorize other countries and populations by removing sovereignty, by removing land, by removing language, by removing culture and governance and freedom. And so how is it that we pay attention to telling the truth as well as telling the truth with the grain of the possibility of creativity between us? I find that gentleness is a great art here, not because gentleness plasters over and means that you say simple things. I think gentleness means that you say utterly brutal things to each other and say it in a way where the other, where the other person might have to stay in the same room. Because that is one of the most important things we have is that those people who have done difficulty might have the possibility of acknowledging what they've done in the face of that, in the hopes that there can be some recognition if not reconciliation. I have another poem that I'll finish with, but I'd love to take some questions. I'll teach you before we do about how to say my name. It's Padraig, uh, two syllables, paw, almost like the paw of a dog, and rig, um, drig, um, rhyming, rhyming with um, oil rig. So paw, drig is how you say my name, just in case you were wondering. I know it's not a name that lots of you are familiar with. So how do we do the Q&A? Um, are you going to bring them, Mark? You're muted. Uh, Mark, we can't hear you because you're muted. I apologize. I thought I thought I'd have muted myself. I'm sorry. Um, okay. Padre, uh, someone, someone had written that uh, they could listen to you speak all day. And I think <laughs> that's true of all of us here. Not just the beauty of your voice, but the uh, the power of your thoughts and the wisdom. And you're speaking of something that all of us have been dealing with for most of our lives, mm. um, if not our entire lives. So we thank you enormously for that. Mary Catan has asked, uh, what have you learned about the people you've worked with or know who have been able to move into this art of a life? How do we help ourselves or others move in this direction? What is the role of spiritual practice? Thanks, Mary. Um, I can't see the word spiritual without thinking of the body. Um, I, I'm a bit of a materialist, really. <laughs> and spiritual spirit comes from the word um, spirare, which means breath. And so to be spiritual is really about the question of the quality of your breathing and the experience of your breathing. And so what is the possibility of being able to breathe after somebody, after you've been through a time of difficulty? That might be a really problematic relationship with a boss or a colleague at work or an employee, or it might be after a divorce, or it might be all of these things that might seem parochial and intimate and nearby, not on the level of a big war, but on the level of something that was um, really disruptive to you, a, a difficult relationship with a neighbor where you felt, unsafe or just on at, on at home in your own home. And so for me, the question is, is what's the quality of your breathing like and what does it mean to pay attention to that? 
And it is important to say that we can become addicted to our own bitternesses. <laughs> I think one of the things that Mary Oliver is doing in that brutal poem is trying to exercise herself of that and put it out there and put something out for the record that in the midst of telling the brutality of this relationship, she's also trying to define a certain kind of pity. And that's an extraordinary generosity that she's doing, but it's also an accountability. And so with me along the question of spirituality is always going to accompany it. What do you want? Because ultimately what a person wants, they will put their energy towards. It's not to say that we can all get what we want or do what we want. It's not as easy as that. There are circumstances that interrupt, but um, certainly what we want will guide us. And to my mind, one of the things that's really important is to imagine what creativity looks like on the other side of pain. And I don't just mean painting or writing a poem or doing a dance or learning the piano. I mean, something of the creativity, which is about having a life where you feel like you can be creative in yourself, where you can think, I'm going to have a party or I'm going to bake a cake or I'm doing things for the enjoyment of things rather than feel like, feeling like your life has been taken hostage by somebody who is continuing to exert control long after control has been put there where they might be dead or forgotten or they might, you know, etc. So for me, these are all the questions um, that come up within the context of that. I think having a relationship with the question of creativity, having a relationship too with what life looks like on the far side of revenge, um, so that you're not just thinking, after this happens, after I get that acknowledgement, then I'll start spending 15 minutes a day saying nice things to my kids. Then I'll start reading a poem a day. Then I'll start that meditation practice. Because if you're waiting and waiting and waiting, you're giving all kinds of control to the person who is the perpetrator. And in a certain sense, you'll feel like you're betraying yourself if you ever begin to live into creativity and freedom. When people are in situations of conflict resolution, I don't want them to think about the, the big showdown that might happen, but I'm interested in what will happen on the first day of peace? What will that look like? And to think about how can you begin living that now in order that that will help you through the showdown and into the crisis of how do I live after I've had some level of, of resolve? So these are spiritual questions, nothing to do with religion or God, but everything to do with the way that you breathe in your life. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, parishioner John Ford, who you may well recall, who helped us organize your visit along with his wife, Becky, yeah. says it's great to see you again. And he said that he's reminded of something that Father Martin Laird uh, said that when he was preaching in a sermon largely about forgiveness here at Christ Church, that just because forgiveness may be vitally important for the forgiver, it doesn't mean what was done to you is okay. Mm -hmm. that we need to separate the effects of the act on us from the forgiveness of it. What do you think of that? I think that um, Father Martin was speaking wisdom. Um, there is no place for justification of wrongdoing and forgiveness. If forgiveness is to be in any way safe, it has to be an acknowledgement of harm. Um, because if on the one hand you're saying that what was done to you wasn't bad, well then, even, <laughs> then there's no need to forgive it. You know, if you're, if you're often we're caught in this profound ambivalence where you're wanting to say, OK, I forgive you, but also what you did with me is fine and I, I, it's totally understandable. And that's a deep sense of ambivalence. And so one of the things that forgiveness and forgiving asks of us is to have resolve, to have a sense of our own dignity, to say that was that was completely wrong. What happened to me? In in lots of situations, there is a situation where what somebody has done to you is 100 percent wrong. And there is nothing that you've contributed to it in ambivalent situations like we can have in all kinds of family situations or parish or workplace situations. There's ways within which you go. Yeah, I contributed to it. Sure. But still, your response to me was wrong. You know, so I understand that there's a spectrum about that, but there needs to be a moral reading in order to be able to choose something creative, which is, I think, to think, how am I going to live well at this? And forgiveness, as I was saying earlier on, is one of the positive possibilities. So I have a question is, are there some Bible stories that have helped you go deeper in dealing with forgiveness? Or are there some Bible stories that have actually, you think, actually hurt us in terms of thinking about how to go about forgiveness? 
yes and yes. <laughs> um, I mean, the, the story of the prodigal son is such an interesting story. First of all, it's told so poorly uh, in being called the prodigal son, because really it's the story of three men. And in it, you see a father with the two sons. There's no mother being narrated in this story. And you see really that they are in a profound lack of communication with each other. And like lots of Luke's parables, and it's only in the Gospel of Luke that you find this intriguing story, it, it ends on a frustration. You know, the son who had went away has come back and maybe the son had good reason to go. Lots of us have been the daughters or sons who left and we would go, yeah, I was right to leave because I needed to. Even if it caused pain, I needed to. And so anyway, the son who comes back is suddenly welcomed back with this exuberance that causes the older brother to feel resentful. And as a matter of fact, the father doesn't even tell the older brother that his younger brother has come back. The older brother is still out working in the fields and asks somebody who works in the household, what's the story with the sound of the party? And it's then that one of his father's employees says, oh, your brother's back. What a demonstration of the lack of capacity of this father, that um, there was three bewildered men, really, each of them trying to figure out what it means to be themselves and how to communicate. This, I think, is a very modern text to speak about a psychoanalytic reading, about masculinities, about the desire for intimacy, the desire for space, the desire for independence and self-actualization, self perhaps the long wake of grief. And how in the midst of proximity and distance do we navigate certain kinds of relationships? How can we project all kinds of affection onto people who are far away, but actually project all kinds of resentment onto the one who's the nearest by? So I think a deep reading of this text, of the story of the father and two sons, is one where we can often find ourselves holding sympathy for these three different characters, as well as the other characters who were mentioned peripherally in the text. But I, um, I think that story has often been told in a shallow way. The dad's, the father's good. The older brother is just a resentful bastard. And then the younger son was bad, turns around, comes back forgiven. Lovely. My God, what a failure of imagination. I think anybody who's an adult um, realizes that any situation where those kinds of relationships are present are always going to be far more complex. So I think that's one story where really it's the question as to how you read it. And what's the purpose of reading it? And what's the what's the locating of self in the narrative and in connection with the... Um, yeah, of course. Understood. Yeah. Okay. Uh, please mute yourself, folks, if you could. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. Three bewildered men that uh, if you want to look at it, I think that's wonderful. So Parishioner Karen Rice asks, can you speak to the conflict that has erupted in Belfast this past <laughs> week? We, we talked a little bit about that in the opening, just you acknowledged that was going on. And but yeah. could you speak a little more in depth about that? Um, probably not, because we've got eight minutes left or 15. Yeah. Um, so first of all, it's, it's more than just in Belfast. It's in a few different places. Really, what you need to do is to look at what's happening here and to see that there's multiple layers of this. First of all, we're 100 days today into a Brexit policy that is the absolute abdication of power by the British government into the question of peace in Northern Ireland. Boris Johnson, before him, Theresa May, and before her, um, David Cameron, have, have, I think, been failures of leaders of the British side of the peace process of British-Irish peace. And so the, the pretense that you can have what's called a Brexit without that impacting somehow on the border between the Republic of Ireland and the North or between trade between the North of Ireland and across to Scotland and England and Wales, it, it, it was asking to have impossible things side by side. And so that I think is... Um, that is a really powerful recognition that this is a symptom of the abdication of power. It's also a symptom that in Protestant British loyalist areas across the north of Ireland, there has been um, a lack of political leadership where po political leaders have been happier to try to get riots going in their community rather than to provide um, education policies that deal with a post-traumatic society that enact um, serious systemic ways of responding to a long-term um, long 
uh, ignoring about what flourishing and mental health and community health and community well-being can look like. Um, another layer to this is that we're at the end of a year where um, we've had very, very strict lockdowns. Um, so for the, since November, uh, most shops are closed, all pubs are closed, all restaurants are closed. Um, because of the response here, which I think has been good. We've had fewer deaths proportionately than across the water in Britain. But um, that does come with a level of fury and frustration and where people are trying to figure out how on earth are we going to feel in any way safe again. And so I think those are just, just three layers. One, governmental um, neglect of particularly affected areas. Two, Brexit. And um, three, um, uh, the pandemic. Those are just three. Um, and we could go on more. And those really have conflated to the repetition of what is an old habit here, which is um, provoking young people to riot by government in order that government can feel like, look, there is a problem. And then criminalizing those very young people who've been provoked by the very politicians who've sometimes done it. And so there's a level of complicity within the context of that. Um, so uh, yeah, I think those are all yeah. layers to, to, uh, to ask. I'd, I'd recommend looking at, there's a couple of articles on the Irish Times. I think you can read three or four articles free a month in the Irish Times without a subscription. And I'd recommend having a look on the front page of the Irish Times and reading through those. I think they're beneficial. Thank you. And o Owen Jones from The Guardian has also done some very helpful um, engagements um, where he's speaking to, to youth workers and community workers and some clergy on the ground too. So you'll find that for free on the Guardians. Maybe it's the Observer. Can't remember. They're the same thing. You mentioned um, something about a, a pilgrimage of forgiveness or reconciliation. I thought you said something about. It. I was being metaphorical. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so if someone's deeply s stuck right now, you know, and struggling deeply to forgive another person or perhaps an institution or. Mm. Um, what advice would you give them just to kind of, and are there any support groups for people struggling to deal with forgiveness? Um, I, well, first of all, I would say, what do they want? Um, that for me is a much more important question than whether they forgive or not. What do they want? And how could there be some kind of pastoral support? Um, and is the word forgiveness helpful? Is the concept of forgiveness helpful? Is there a different shape to living well here? Is the word understanding, like I mentioned before with Joe Barry and Danielle Pearl, um, do they have enough safety? Because it, it, I think it's inappropriate um, to be in a situation where you're trying to forgive while safety is continuing to be per, uh, undermined. Um, is there an, an imagination that forgiveness looks like the reestablishment of something without a acknowledgement or b any recognition that the ground has changed as a result of pain? So I suppose I, all of those, I'd like there to be a recognition if I was to support somebody to ask all of those things and then to say, you don't have to do anything. What do you want to do and what will support you? That for me would be part of what a, a journeying alongside somebody would look like. And if a person is looking for support, I think finding somebody with whom they can talk, who can be objective and who does not have an overt investment in here's what forgiveness looks like and here's how we'll get you there, because maybe that will actually pile abuse upon the abuse, even well-intentioned. Um, so I suppose accompaniment in that situation looks well. Um, yeah. So someone has asked, and this is a very simple question, but uh, the same time a very difficult question and that is um why is forgiveness so hard for us <laughs> well i think we can take that in all kinds of ways one of which is is it's so for, so difficult to forgive ourselves as well it's, forgiveness is not just something we do to another person or to a person with more power it can also be something where we know very well that it can be very difficult to forgive yourself and I think it's the mystery about why is it so difficult to be an adult? Why is it so difficult to maintain close relationships that don't need navigated in terms of proximity as well as distance? Why can it be so difficult at times to love someone and not be infuriated by them, even if that's yourself, etc.? Why sometimes on the cusp of something being beautiful, 
do we have such a habit of destroying it? Why are we so frightened sometimes of the possibility of achievement that we would much rather look at the um, repetition of a narrative of destruction than we would face into the possibility of our own um, creativity and liveliness? So I think forgiveness is difficult because of all those reasons, because it's difficult to be human. And there are all kinds of unexpected things that happen to us. Um, forgiveness isn't something to get to do and then get on with the rest of your life. Forgiveness is your life, as well as growing up, as well as safety, as well as just it is part of an everyday plate to be spun. Sometimes it's going to take loads of your energy. Sometimes you barely notice it at all. But it's always going to be part of, of an adult life is to pay attention to this. We do not have full control. Some people have loads of control, either because they got it or because they took it. Who knows? Um, but forgiveness is one of the things that highlights to us the question about our relationship with control. And control and power, too, are always going to be part of the navigation of the mystery of being an adult. What if our priest has asked, what happens to our mind and body and spirit if we don't forgive? Um, sometimes you flourish. <laughs> <laughs> forgiveness is only one good idea um there's loads of other good ideas too yeah. distance safety so um yeah i suppose i'd want to trouble that question um because sometimes not forgiving is a damn fine choice um because the circumstances mightn't be great for forgiving or because you just think you know what i have such negative associations with forgiving it has been associated with terrible theology and terrible manipulation i'm going to be distant enough and deliberately not um, stoke feelings of revenge in myself. That's pretty good. You might go, oh, I don't forgive. But you might also go, God, I've barely thought about them in the last five years. That's pretty good. So the question for me is, what does it mean to be in a circumstance where you can live safely um, and well and creatively? Forgiveness within the context of that can be a magnificent creative choice, but so can other things. And what that will always bring up is the question of privilege and power um, and who has that. And so forgiveness will always open up the systems of power within which the initial perpetration happened. And so that's always worthwhile asking too. Now, Becky, who helped, Becky Ford, who helped to bring the first. Magnificent act. painter. Yes, exactly. And she's painting at this moment as she's listening. Mm -hmm. she said, do you have any, do you have thoughts about when a person is triggered in their body when wounds that they have emotionally and psychologically done a lot to work with arise. Yeah. Um, I have little rituals that I do for myself. Um, like I went through some terrible things when I was younger and there's days when I feel like uh, if they're rarer, the older I get, but there's days when I just feel like, my God, the fury is back. And I just go, well, here it is. I need to face this at 42 or 45 or 32 or, whatever age I am. And I think sometimes to resist it is to give it more power, but to find a way to say, look at that, just shows how deep a hurt can go, that somehow today something has brought this up. Uh, to tend it like it's a frightened animal, um, to tend it to like you love the person who's experiencing it, i.e. yourself, um, but also to, to tend it where you say, I also know other things are true, that I've had years of flourishing and I found creativity in this and safety and I was able to navigate that family reunion or navigate that thing that happened back at work and I went through that and I got through that so on the one hand to say it's true but on the other hand to say I've lived far enough from it to know that it's not the only thing that's true um yeah as well as to to know and I don't say this in a self-condemning way but as well as to say I too have hurt people and to find a way where when they are having a day where the way that you've hurt them has come up and hits you, hits them particularly between the eye where you might go, that's OK, I'll just keep out of their way for a while because they're having one of those days where they're revisited by their pain. Hopefully they can live with it creatively, but creative living with the reoccurring echoes of pain is not about denying it, but it's also not about saying it's the only thing that's true. These are adult conversations to have and I think we have to have adult recognitions of pluralities of things that can be true all at the same time so that's what I think yeah I hope that's helpful 
That is, that is. And what if we have a, a child or a grandchild who we know harbors a lot about us, maybe against us, I could say, mm -hmm. but we're not sure what it is and may, they have a hard time articulating. Is there a way that we can tease that out or get, mm -hmm. allow them the space to articulate that with us? Well, sometimes in, in intergenerational connections like that, um, resentment and anger is a form of intimacy. I don't say that to justify abuse, but like Freud, who I'm influenced by, um, had a recognition that children who wail and scream are actually giving voice to the kind of rage that we all live with. They're just a little bit less censored in it. And so I remember when I was in school, I was furious at some of my teachers, furious. And I would let that rage in history class or religion class. They were lovely people. <laughs> I was in a situation where if, if, where if I let my rage be expressed at home, there would have been profound violence as a response. So in a certain sense, I was teaching, treating the teachers to a need I had to figure out what does it mean to give voice to rage here? I was practicing what rage looked like without the possibility of violence from me or towards me. And that I think is a certain, kind. it can be a certain kind of intimacy. Um, I think there are all kinds of ways within which every generation will have to face the ways within which what they are looking to inherit is certainly going to be impacted both for positive and for negative by the generations that have come before. And so there's a possibility of accountability within that. Um, so there's all kinds of there's all kinds of things that might happen within the context of, of of an intergenerational. One of which, if it's safe enough, might be that the experience of rage is a certain kind of possibility of the communication of somebody who's saying, "Well, you're safe enough to be furious around because I trust that you're not going to respond to me with violence or to respond to me with the kind of fury that I'm trying to figure out how to curate in my own life." Mary Catan, who's a spiritual director and a therapist on our staff, said, I hear so many levels of empathy and compassion, not only for others, but for yourself as well. So much acceptance. So very helpful. <laughs> she says, thank you. Thanks. I wonder if... Hard I could one. <laughs> is there anyone who taught you how to forgive? And can we teach others? I mean, I don't think forgiveness is taught. Um I, I think we I think we look at other people and we we recognize the way that they live in certain parts of their life and we see, oh, that's what that can look like. Um, but that's not from a book. I don't think there are very fine books written about forgiveness. And if you're interested, I, I think I would certainly recommend Richard Holloway's book on forgiveness published by Canongate. It's a very short volume. Um, and I think he is the most careful, especially in writing about forgiveness, where there is the, the hangover, really, of a religious obligation that can sometimes be a great burden on the burdened. Um, but forgiveness is practiced and forgiving is practiced. We learn it from ourselves um, and we learn it from seeing it from those around us. And by asking, I mean, I think it's a magnificent thing. You know, we've got so many um, we've been so separate from each other for this last year. And one of the things I hope is that when we have the possibility of meeting up in cafes or bars or restaurants with each other, where we might go, you know, rather than just talking about what you saw on the television or having the same political discussion we had the last time, you can say, um, what's it like for you to forgive? <laughs> you know, ask each other those questions because we're clearly fascinated by them. Uh, also not, you know, what do you like about art or do you believe in God? Like, really? Like, ask each other those questions, not to put each other into corners, but to think how curious we can be to each other. And yeah, I, I think those things are, are great ways of being human with each other, because to ask them when we're not in the throes of feeling overdone by some pain or some desire for revenge or guilt um, might mean that they're, when we are in those moments of rage or pain, that there are some resources in the imagination um, waiting for us to reflect on them. I want to ask you one final question, if I may. Um, what can the church do to promote forgiveness? And what are some of the ways in which the church may inadvertently restrict it? Yeah, I mean, I suppose the church is a big thing. Um, so it kind of would depend where I'm thinking. I mean, as I think of the Irish Catholic Church, 
I think the thing that the Irish Catholic Church can do to promote forgiving is to apologize. <laughs> so I, I wouldn't want to say about any other place because I'm not from there. Um, but certainly when you look, not only because of the mother and baby homes and because of the abuses, but because of the profound addiction to power that you found within the Catholic Church, that is not just about a situation of profound sexual violation of an individual of whatever age and whatever gender, but also because of all the other ways that reached into people's lives for the purpose of control in the name of God. So I sometimes wish that the National Cathedral or the equivalent of the Irish National Cathedrals would all turn their um, altars over and celebrate Eucharist from split altars for a decade. My God, wouldn't be a bad thing. Um, and then to follow that in policy, um, which isn't to say that everybody in the Catholic Church has done the terrible things, but that there are ways within which we need public gestures. And Jesus of Nazareth and the Gospels knew about those. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that might be the way. Often I do see that the Christian imagination is one that wishes to, uh, to, to missionize, you know, to be a missionary for. And I think that age needs to be gone. I'm uninterested in people who have strategic project plans to try to recruit or do things because it will bring people in. Just do it. If that brings people in, magnificent. If not, the gospel will find another way to live. Beautiful way to end. Thank you. You've taken us, uh, it's like peeling an onion. And, you know, we <laughs> often, so often live on the surface and you, you've taken us into great depth. And uh, for those who joined late, uh, this has been recorded and will be on our website for a while so that it's so rich in content and this it's so vital for so many of us struggling with forgiveness. We can't thank you enough for what you've shared oh, with us. Um, okay. I have a poem that I thought I'd finish with, if that's okay. Lovely. It's a poem of blessing called um, Go to Hell. <laughs> I'm fascinated by hell. Um, so go to hell. He is called to hell, this man. He is called to glory. He knows well those twisted ways and those who've lost their story. He is called to clay, this man. He is called to yearning. He has heard of hidden streams that heal those tired of burning. He's searching out those raised in hell. He wants to know the things they know. He believes in dreamland where the ragged people go. He is called to quiet now. He is called to silence, to squat down on the breaking ground with those who've swallowed violence. He is called to anguished thoughts. He is called to flowers, to find in hell's own lonely fury that which no flame devours. I saw him on the midway path. I saw he carried two things only. On his trip to hell, this man, he is carrying story. Thanks very much for the possibility of being with you all. Thank you. And we'll look for your books at the uh, Dogwood Books and Gift Store. And uh, we hope to have you back sometime in the future. Thank you for sharing yourself. Thank you. Thanks, Thank everyone. Bye-bye.